Chapter 10, The FSB Connection. For some time, hope for genuine cooperation between the West and Russia had pervaded the climate of international politics. That all the former communist nations in Eastern Europe had been accepted into NATO made this hope seem reasonable. In the meantime, however, a covert and desperate rivalry between the CIA and FSB, successor to the KGB, that was never reported in the press had reached new intensity. If an outside observer had been able to look in on a certain clandestine psychic commando base secluded in the deep woods an hour north of Moscow, he would have found its activities and goals to be in complete contradiction to the peace initiatives being outwardly promoted by Russia's new democratic leaders. On a blustery day in late April, two years after the sale of Ken Inman's secret laboratory to the CIA, Russian Army Colonel Alexei Chernov, commander of the secret commando base, stood watching a platoon of his elite troops. They were practicing harangue do on a soggy field that still held a few patches of snow in the almost perpetual shadows of the 12-foot-high wall marking the highly classified installation's southern periphery. Chernoff was a powerful brute of a man with the arrogant cockiness of a professional fighter. In superb physical condition, he appeared to be much younger than his 52 years. Having lost both parents in the Battle of Stalingrad, he had come up the hard way, through life and in the army as well. He was a survivor in every sense of the word. On this particular day, statue-like, with arms folded, Chernoff remained longer than usual on a path behind the hedge that made it possible for him to watch his troops unobserved. A nasty situation had developed at the base that occupied his thoughts and kept him from seeing what he appeared to be looking at for so long. At last he seemed to remember that he should be elsewhere. Spinning around, he traversed the muddy parade ground and turned onto a walkway that led between two long brick buildings. He seemed to be heading for the largest structure on the base, straight ahead of him. Two soldiers, armed with automatic weapons, patrolling just in front of it, prepared to salute. When the colonel suddenly turned off to his right, down another walk that led to what appeared to be a gymnasium. A large red sign in front of the guarded building declared in bold Cyrillic letters, Bektoref Research Institute, authorized personnel only. The inside was a maze of corridors lined with offices and laboratories of various sizes and degrees of importance. In the center was a large and elaborate psychic research laboratory to which all corridors eventually led. It consisted of a main room with several auxiliary rooms adjoining each of which had at least one window of one-way glass opening onto the lab. Thus, it was possible from a number of angles to observe the laboratory activity without disturbing the concentration of those involved. And, of course, without those participating in the experiments knowing that they were being watched. One-way glass from floor to ceiling between the main control room and the lab provided a broad view of all activity from a location that was elevated about 10 feet for better observation. Inside that vantage point, the scientist in charge, Viktor Koryev, a slim, prematurely graying and scholarly-looking man of about 40, was directing two assistants through a final check of a complex bank of instruments. By reason of diligent hard work and an undeniable brilliance, Dr. Koryev had established himself as the top Russian involved in advanced psychic research, so secret that even within the Kremlin itself, only a handful of leaders knew about it. His only apparent flaw was a troublesome habit of independent thinking that didn't fit well into the Russian military system, a flaw which so far had been largely overlooked in recognition of his great value, particularly in relation to his present work. In the lab below, two other scientists, Pyotr Dobrovsky, a relative newcomer, and Dmitry Petrikov, Victor's close colleague and confidant of several years, 
were connecting the last wires to a man who, from the perspective above, looked undersized and vulnerable, where he reclined at a slight angle in a special padded armchair. Victor followed intently the quick, sure movements he observed below. His own composure was a studied professionalism. Beneath the surface, however, like each of the other scientists, he was very much aware that the experiment they were about to begin, an experiment which he had not wanted to perform, would very likely end in disaster, as had the two immediately previous attempts. We're ready down here, crackled Dmitri's voice over the intercom. I want to know the instant anyone detects the slightest abnormality, anything, ordered Victor over the microphone in front of him, where he was now seated at the main control panel. Is that clear? Right, came Dmitri's prompt response from below. The two assistants, seated beside Victor, nodded without taking their eyes from the panel before them. There, on dozens of graphs, needles were already tracing out brain waves, heartbeat, blood pressure, oxygen level in the bloodstream, and other vital data. You're cleared for trans-state, Yakov, said Victor quietly. In spite of himself, his voice reflected his own reluctance and apprehension. The psychic, securely strapped into a huge chair, nodded almost imperceptibly. He was already well on his way to out-of-body readiness. His hands, which had gripped the arms of the special chair, had now gone limp. Total relaxation marked every visible muscular capability. Yakov, listen carefully. Victor was speaking in a slow, even-paced cadence. At the word stop, you will instantly come out of it. Is that clear? Yes. Yakov's voice was barely audible. Victor pressed the button on a special panel to his left. On the screen immediately in front of the psychic was projected a slide of a group of several buildings surrounded by a high wall. Then the scene changed to the central structure of the complex. That is your target, Yakov. The location is in the coastal hills south of San Francisco, about 12 miles west of Palo Alto, California. Agents in the field indicate it's a CIA installation involved in advanced psychic research, perhaps similar to our own. Victor's voice was deliberately hypnotic now. Enter the target building and gather all possible data in the time we can allow. If you have any trouble of any kind, even the slightest, communicate it to me immediately. Is that clear? Yakov nodded slowly. His eyes glazed over, and on their surface, the target structure was now dimly reflected. The heavy lids drooped and closed. Victor pushed another button, and the screen began to reflect a computer-enhanced digital conversion of what Yakov himself was seeing in his presumed out-of-body journey. The picture was taken directly from his brainwaves through an ingenious electronic enhancement process that Victor himself had only recently developed. Indistinct and intermittent at first, the image slowly became clearer and more recognizable. Everything was being recorded on videotape directly from the instrument projecting the picture as Yakov was seeing it in his brain. The image became sharper as the building was approached. There was a sense of floating through space. With a slight jerk and a momentary blackout, the target was penetrated by Yakov, and the view was now of its interior. The inside walls seemed to have little substance as Yakov's probing mind repeatedly passed through them in the process of traversing corridors and entering rooms. Suddenly, two shadowy figures approached from the background, one from each side of the screen. For a fleeting moment, the face of the figure on the right, who seemed to be in a long hooded robe, became clearly delineated. He had never appeared in previous experiments of this nature. Victor let out a grunt of recognition, however, when the face of the man on the left came briefly into view. Though his features were slightly distorted, he looked unmistakably like Stanford University professor Frank Layton, recently a rising star in international psychic research circles. His presence was quickly recorded on a computer. I'm inside, nothing special to report yet, 
Yakov's words came slowly and with great effort. I sense that the central lab is off to my right. Suddenly, the hooded figure blocked Yakov's progress, pointing threateningly at his invisible position. In the next moment, the image projected from Yakov's brain became a whirling kaleidoscope of distortions, a phantasmagoria of gyrating substance and line. The needles monitoring the psychic vinyl signs went berserk. Help, screamed Yakov in terror. I'm being pulled in. They've got me. Stop, Victor yelled into his microphone. Stop, Yakov. That's an order. Stop. Yakov's face had become a death mask of agony. His body began to convulse, straining desperately at the straps holding him. Suddenly, there was a blinding flash as Yakov was torn loose by some incredible power and thrown across the room. Hitting the opposite wall 30 feet away with a frightening impact, his shattered body seemed to hang for a moment before dropping to the concrete floor like a slab of raw meat. See to him now, Victor yelled into the mic, then turned to run for the stairs leading to the lab below. Dmitri reached Yakov's crumpled body quickly and recoiled in horror. Moy bog, he gasped and stared down helplessly. Rising up to take command of the emergency, Victor could only stand transfixed beside Dmitri. The violence wreaked on Yakov was clearly far worse than in the two previous accidents. There didn't appear to be an unbroken bone in his body. Yet his left hand gripped a felt pen of American manufacture that the investigators later would not be able to identify as belonging to Yakov or having been in the building prior to that moment. As Victor, Dmitri, and Piotr, the three scientists on the project, watched in frozen terror, that lifeless arm began to move. In clear block letters, it printed a brief sentence in Greek on the bare floor. The scratching of the felt pen added a final eerie touch to the macabre scene before them. Then the silence of death. Still in shock, Victor struggled frantically to gather his wits. Get a computer translation of that message, he told Piotr, who pulled a pad from his pocket and, scarcely knowing what he was doing, managed to copy the strange writing. With apprehensive backward glances, he hurried from the lab. Victor turned to a stunned assistant. Yuri, get Colonel Chernoff here immediately. In the gymnasium, The colonel was seated in yoga position on a raised platform facing about 40 newly inducted elite troops, also in lotus position. He had just led them in a 20-minute meditation. The last om faded into the walls. Each recruit, like the colonel, was wearing a black gi with federal troops insignias. Chernoff stood suddenly and extended his arms with fists clenched toward the men. Open your eyes. He commanded and motioned for two assistants to bring a heavy slab of concrete and hold it out in front of him. You are about to witness bioenergy extension, he explained. You will be taught to project this energy beyond your bodies. Meditation is the key for developing it. Hiya! With a quick karate jab, Chernoff's hand smashed through the six inch thick slab, sending concrete splinters flying. You assume it was my hand that smashed the concrete, but your eyes deceive you. Chernoff paused dramatically to let the recruits think that over. In fact, my hand made no contact. The invisible force extending from my hand shattered the slab. That force, when you learn through meditation how to focus it, acts as a protective shield over the entire body. A thin smile tugged at the corners of his mouth as he reached for a delicate glass beaker and slid his right hand into it. He motioned for the two other men to bring another concrete slab and hold it up in front of him. hey The colonel's glass-encased fist lashed out with lightning speed and again the demolished concrete slab splintered into a hundred pieces. Stepping back in triumph, Chernoff let the delicate glass beaker, still intact, drop from his hand to the floor where it shattered upon impact. Arriving from the laboratory still in shock, Yuri quietly entered the gymnasium and stood respectfully at the rear, 
anxiously trying to get the colonel's attention. There was no mistaking the look of terror on his face. At last, Chernoff noticed and quickly motioned for him to come forward. Yakov has been killed, Yuri whispered breathlessly. Chernoff's eyes blazed with anger. Without asking further details, he put his assistant, Major Rusak, in charge and immediately hurried from the gym, followed closely by Yuri. By the time Chernoff entered the lab, Victor was back in the control room going over the data and shaking his head in puzzled unbelief. Seeing the colonel, he came down to join him beside the body. This is your responsibility, Dr. Kuryev, barked Chernoff. No, Victor responded firmly. I was not in favor of risking another life. That was your decision. The committee gave the order, but on your insistence. Though so frail in comparison, Victor stood his ground almost nose to nose with his powerfully built superior, staring him down with unwavering eyes. The colonel had long found this unbreakable man's individuality and unorthodox behavior maddening. Watching from a safe distance while directing the rest of the staff and shutting down equipment and gathering ripped wires and debris, Dmitri felt a growing sense of dread. Chernoff's mind was made up. He had one passion for months now, to nail Koryev's hide to the wall, and this was more than sufficient justification. Yakov's death has jeopardized the program. You let him die. Why? He didn't die, Victor snapped back. He was killed like the others, by something beyond our control. I told you that we were warned, but you wouldn't let me tell that to the committee. Warned? That's fantasy. Colonel, listen to this tape of Yakov's last words. Victor quickly went to a nearby control panel and pushed the button. Yakov's voice came over the speaker. Help! I'm being pulled in! They've got me! Turning off the sound, Victor demanded, They've got me? Who are they, Colonel? Certainly no one in this lab. He was out of body inside that CIA lab in California. That's who they are, Colonel. They got him just like they got the two before him. And that's why I didn't want to risk another man, but you insisted. He was incoherent at that point, objected Chernoff, pointing to the writing on the floor. Look at that gibberish. Yakov was dead before he wrote that. Impossible. We have the data recorded on the monitors. He was ripped out of the wires, said Chernoff. You've got nothing when he was lying here. Look at his body and his mangled left arm. Even if he'd still been alive, he couldn't have written anything. At that moment, Piotr returned and handed a piece of paper to Victor. Here's the translation of your gibberish, Colonel. It was written in Greek. Victor held it out for Chernoff to see himself, then began to read aloud. Death to Prometheus, Archon. This is the third warning, Colonel. Prometheus, Archon, growled Chernoff. If those are code names for American agents, we'll hunt them down. If it takes the whole FSB worldwide network. You might try looking first on Mount Olympus, headquarters of the gods, suggested Victor caustically, making no attempt to soften the derision in his voice, even though he knew how dangerous it was to bait Chernoff. Surely you remember in your wide reading that in Greek mythology, Prometheus stole fire from the gods and they punished him. It's quite obvious that Archon has punished us. Chernoff's face became livid. What he lacked in education, he made up for in native cunning. Victor's stinging sarcasm would be repaid not with brute strength, but with a false accusation he could find difficult to deny. You're saying the gods did this? Doctor, the committee meets tomorrow to inquire about the two previous deaths, and now we have a third. We'll see how amused they'll be with your fairy tales. He turned abruptly and stormed out of the lab. Dmitri's concern had turned to dismay. He was terrified for his friend. Come, take a look at this, he said, motioning Victor toward the shattered chair. As they bent over it together, Dmitri whispered, He's a dangerous man, Victor, and he intends to destroy you. Don't make it easier for him. Victor's mind was wrestling with the immediate puzzle before them. 
The colonel is right, he said softly. Dead men don't write messages. But we all saw it happen. Yakov was dead, Dmitri, and even alive, his brain could not have commanded his arm in that condition to move. So what happened couldn't have been Yakov's subconscious. That's the established theory we've been clinging to in spite of the evidence. But we can't escape the truth any longer. If it wasn't his unconscious mind when he was dead, then it needn't have been when he was alive. Something else is in control, even when we don't realize it. What do you mean? We're being watched and manipulated by some higher intelligence. Archon, whoever or whatever that represents, is letting us know that it holds the key to psychic powers and is not happy with the way we're using them. Dmitri was too stunned by this revolutionary idea to reply. I'll tell you what else it means, suggested Victor. Archon must exist outside the material dimension, but with the capability of invading it at will. Instantly, Dmitri put up a cautionary hand on his friend's shoulder. You keep talking like that and you'll end up in a labor camp, he whispered. They both glanced anxiously around and noticed the soldier standing in the doorway and straining to hear what they were saying. What are you doing here? Victor demanded. We've come for the body, sir. Well, take it then, he barked, then said to Dmitri, I feel like some fresh air. Victor turned to the rest of his staff, who still seemed to be too shocked to function. I think it would do us all good to get out of here, get some rest. Tomorrow is the hearing, and you should all be prepared to give a clear account of what you've witnessed. Outside, the two comrades found a bench in a secluded place, where they kept their faces turned away from buildings that might hide eavesdropping devices poised in their direction. Earnestly, Victor tried to persuade his friend. Listen to me, Dimitri. Everyone admits that if life could start on Earth, it could happen on other planets too. There has to be intelligent life out there, and finding it is a significant part of the space program for us and the Americans. Isn't that true? Of course, conceded Dimitri, wondering what this had to do with Victor's unthinkable performance with Chernoff. We've had contact with intelligent life from beyond Earth. Can't you see that? But it isn't the kind we were expecting, and we didn't find them through probing outer space. They've come to us in inner space. We haven't seen their bodies because I don't think they have any. Watch your step, responded Dimitri. Think it, if you wish, but don't ever say it, not even to me. If the committee ever suspects that you think non-physical intelligences exist, well, don't expect me to visit you in Siberia. Forget the committee and give me a hearing, comrade. You're the only one I can talk to. Now suppose these entities do exist. What entities? Your thesis is pure fantasy. We saw two figures on the video. You think they were non-physical? Dr. Layton, of course, you recognized him too. I'm sure it was physical. He could be in charge of the lab, but the other figure, the hooded one, the force came through him, I'm sure of it. Since when does the CIA wear such robes? That was an archon, dressed like death. Dmitri looked around apprehensively. Keep your head down when you talk, he hissed. You're getting careless. They have devices. I know the devices. We're too far away, so long as we face away from the buildings. But he leaned closer to Dmitri as he continued. Now listen to me. I don't think the Americans have the capability of doing what we just saw today. Archon killed Yakov and the others. Archon is not a code name for the CIA. I don't think Archon has a body of its own. It uses the bodies of others. Maybe it kills CIA agents, too. It must have its own purpose. Who or what is Archon? And what is it up to? I've got to find out. From where the two friends sat, they could see a military van drive up to the front door of the lab complex. Feeling strangely detached from the horror they had just experienced, they watched as two soldiers emerge from the building carrying Yakov's crushed remains. They shoved the body into the vehicle, climbed in, and drove off. Dmitri pleaded earnestly with Victor. 
You can't bring Yakov and the others back by sacrificing yourself. What is the purpose of angering Chernoff? Don't do it. And if you want to survive to pursue your research, then don't try to be a hero. Just tell the committee what they want to hear. I have a plan, Victor said cryptically. When Dmitri's eyes asked to know what it was, Victor only shook his head. <laughs> 